on the maritime scene. And uh, very simply, what does it mean for Europe? What does it mean for European countries? This will be the focus of our workshop and our seminar this morning. And I will give the floor first to Antoine Bondaz, then to Philippe Bro, and then Valérie Niquet. Antoine Bondaz is a research fellow uh, at FRS. He will talk about the ongoing modernization of the People's Liberation Army and its capabilities, also for Xi Jinping's uh, ambitions in the context of a great number of air and naval exercises around Taiwan. And I should add also some apparent uh, frequent, increasingly frequent encroachments on the sovereignty of its uh, neighbors. Then I will give the floor to uh, Philippe Gros. Philippe is a, also a research fellow at FRS. He will talk about the uh, US perception of the rapid expansion of uh, Chinese counter-intervention counter capabilities and more extensively uh, about new war fighting concepts de developed by the uh, US uh, military to deal with uh, these trends. And finally, I will give the floor to uh, Valérie Niquet, who's a senior research fellow at FRS, who will uh, talk about the Japanese strategic perspective, especially at the dawn of a, uh, shall we say, a new political era, and certainly with a, a new government. So uh, without further ado, uh, Antoine, the floor is yours. So as Bruno perfectly said, I will be focusing on the ongoing modernization and the political objective of that modernization from the Chinese point of view. And indeed, uh, the PLA, the People Liberation Army, has come a very long way since its birth in August 1st, 1927, when it had only 20,000 soldiers up to the 2 million it has today. So over the past few years, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of China and Chairman of the Central Military Commission, Xi Jinping, has reshaped the PLA with the key objective to make it, it was the title of the presentation, a world-class military force by 2049. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese military parade last October, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the People's uh, Republic of China, was an opportunity for the country both to display its military power, but also to recall that the PLA is the army of the party and not the army of the country. The use of the armed forces to serve the interests of the Chinese Communist Party has been steadily increasing since uh, Xi Jinping came to power. The main mission of the armed forces are clear, to preserve the Chinese political system, that means the CCP's legitimacy and authority. The armed forces also have a key role to play in achieving what the Chinese leader called for, re rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, and I quote, the building of a prosperous country with a strong military. To this end, the PLA is undergoing a significant transformation to achieve three goals set out at the CCP Congress last, uh, I mean, in autumn 2017, to become, I quote, a mechanized army by 2020, a modernized army by 2035, and a world-class, once again, army by 2049. Thus, despite the staging of some limited form of transparency in the last white paper of the event, published in July 2019, China's military capabilities are increasing, and rightly so, a cause of concern in the region and beyond. The PLA is today the world's largest army in terms of numbers, with more than 2 million soldiers, as I said in the introduction. And Beijing today spends more on its defense than all of the Asia-Pacific countries combined. The modernization of China's armed forces is mostly based on the increase of its uh, military spending due to China's formidable economic development. According to the CIPRI figures, it has increased by eight times its military spendings from 30 billion in 1998 to 240 billion in 2018. During the same period, Japan spending increased only by 1 billion to reach 45 billion. This also translates, of course, into a quantitative modernization of the equipment. Between 2014 and 2018, in five years, the Chinese Navy added to its fleet the equivalent in tones of the combined French and Italian fleet in only five years. The country is also investing considerably to modernize its nuclear arsenal, being the only permanent member of the United Nations Security Council to increase currently the size of its arsenal. However, there is a need to ensure the qualitative modernization of all military equipment. China still lacks 
behind the Western armed forces in terms of technology and is investing heavily in new technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, big data, the Internet of Things, and so on, to be able to wage in the future intelligence, I quote, wars. The country also relies, it's quite important from a uh, scientific but also business perspective, heavily on so-called military civil fusion, a national strategy since 2015. The military civil fusion encompasses several interrelated efforts, uh, such as fusing the China's defense industrial base and its civilian technology and industrial base, integrating and leveraging science and technology innovation across military and civil sectors, and so on. In addition to this modernization of capacities, the great efforts of institutional modernization was launched at the end of 2015. The PLA's new structure includes today two new armies, the army, the ground forces, and the rocket force, and two new forces, the strategic support force with its cyber and space capabilities, and the joint logistics support force. The challenges include reducing the weight of the ground forces while improving interoperability. These efforts explain the creation of the title of Commander-in-Chief granted to Xi Jinping, the Commander-in-Chief of the Joint Operation Command Center granted to Xi Jinping in 2016, and the creation also of five fierce commands, each with a joint staff. The reform also led to a higher priority to maritime issues. The country was asked to abandon, I quote, the traditional mentality of a superiority of land over the sea. And the last and the uh, 18th Party Congress in 2012 set the task of building China into a sea power nation. China's Navy indeed has been modernizing for the last 25 years and has become a formidable military force within China's near seas region and is conducting growing number of operations in more distant waters. The Navy uh, today must no longer ensure the defense of coastal waters, but also be able to guarantee the defense of coastal waters and the protection of high seas. The PLA Navy is also asked to develop its operational capabilities in terms of naval combat. The Navy has long worked actually to articulate the very importance of Chinese maritime interests and to advocate for a more capable Navy in order to protect these. And it's clear that the Navy stressed the growing importance of China's maritime and sovereignty claims since China's three main sovereignty disputes in Taiwan, South China Sea and East China Sea all involve a maritime dimension. I will focus now on Taiwan because Taiwan so far remains uh, the top priority of the PLA. The 2013 edition of the Science of Mi and Military Strategy stresses that the most likely conflict that the PLA may face is a war on the periphery of China on a large scale and of high intensity on a maritime battlefield and in a context of nuclear deterrence. It means a potential conflict with Taiwan with the risk of an American intervention. And China's anti-secession law, voted and adopted in 2005, clearly states that China may use non-peaceful means in case of either an independence or in case the peaceful reunification of Taiwan could no longer be achieved. The PRC today continues to signal its willingness to use military force against Taiwan, and the PLA has a range of options to coerce Taipei based on its increasing capabilities in multiple uh, domains. To be clear, in the context, in this context, one of the key objectives of the PLA is to challenge US supremacy in the periphery of China and to deter the United States from intervening or by complicating and limiting its ability to intervene. And I'm sure Philip will discuss it uh, later on. This is actually a major change for the United States, which for decades has had kind of unparalleled military capabilities in the area. That PLA limited ability to respond to the deployment of two US aircraft carrier in the 1995-1996 Taiwan Strait had persuaded actually the Chinese leadership to increase considerably the funding for military modernization. Uh, to do so, the PLA is also deploying new ships, but also expanding, and that's quite important, the PLA Navy Marine Corps and the Marine Corps is growing significantly these last few years. Uh, China actually plans to grow its Marine Corps uh, by 
1,000%, from 10,000 Marines to more than 100,000. In 2017, uh, the construction began to the new flat deck type 075 landing helicopter dock, China's largest amphibious ship so far that could embark up to 900 Marines and up to 30 helicopters. But Taiwan is not the only issue, of course, in the periphery uh, of China. Uh, China's military modernization, indeed, aims also at enforcing China's view that it has a right to regulate foreign military activities in its 200 miles maritime exclusive uh, economic zone or are defending China's commercial sea lines of communication. To be clear, the PRC use of force in territorial disputes has varied widely since 1949 and the building of the PRC. Some disputes led to war including with India in 1962 and with Vietnam in 1979. In some recent land border disputes before, of course, recent events with uh, uh, India, some of them actually were settled with more than six uh, countries. However, in recent years, China has employed a more coercive approach to deal with most of its disputes over maritime features. It means actually that the militarization of many islands in the South China Sea, what you can see actually on uh, the presentation, and to put pressure on its neighbors, China has also diversified its military and, that's quite important, non-military actors, such as the maritime militia, playing a complementary role actually with the Navy and the Coast Guard. Indeed, China's approach to the South China Sea involved seeking to use a range of military, paramilitary, legal, and also administrative tactics to expand Chinese control of disputed features while maximizing the chance, while minimizing, sorry, the chance of military conflicts uh, to break out. The PRC has adopted three lines of defense uh, with the maritime militia as the first, the Coast Guard as the second, and the Navy as the third. Elsewhere, um, elsewhere, Chinese ambition actually, of course, do not stop at Asia. Uh, the growing importance of seaborne trade and increased PRC investment and citizen abroad, including businessmen, students, and tourists, has led actually the leadership of China in 2004 to call for new historic missions to be given to the PLA. The, PLA, the PRC is seeking to establish a more robust overseas logistics and basing infrastructures to allow, of course, the PLA to project and sustain military power at great distances. The first current base is, of course, Djibouti, but the PRC is likely to add some additional overseas military logistical facilities. The country has been participating in more and more military activities abroad, from uh, sending fighting troops to uh, peacekeeping operations starting in 2014 in Mali, but also, of course, as you all know, counter piracy operation as early as 2008 in the Gulf of Aden, but also some non-military operation in, uh, actually uh, implying the PLA Navy, including evacuation of citizens from Libya in 2011 or for Yemen in 2015. Clearly today, the, PLA, the PRC has uh, the largest navy uh, in the world with more than 350 ships and submarines in comparison to the less than 300 from the US. China is today the top ship producing nation by tonnage and is capable of producing most of them. The two largest state-owned shipbuilders, the CSSC and CSIC, merged last year in November 2019 to create the largest ship builder as measured by the production uh, capacity. This merger will enable China to establish a shipbuilding giant capable of building vessels ranging from warships like aircraft carriers to civilian ships such as container ships and oil tankers. The new entity will have approximately 150 scientific research and more than 300,000 people will be working for CSSC. Modernizing the Navy uh, remain, of course, a priority, be it uh, the submarine, the development of aircraft carrier, but also of amphibious uh, ship. And I mentioned earlier the Yushan class, the 075 uh, ship. As you can see on um, this report from the Congressional Research Service from the US, China indeed plans to increase the number of ships. And I will conclude this presentation with a very, very brief 
uh, case study on something that is quite important is the application of military robots and robotics uh, to maritime and military uh, issue. Robotic is considered in China as a strategic emerging industry. In the 2013 edition of the Science of Military Strategy, uh, it was mentioned that the PLA was seeing the beginning of unmanned, invisible and silent warfare, and that the type of war wars were moving from information-based warfare to intelligence-based warfare. In this context, robotics is very important, and the development of underwater unmanned vehicles is one of the priorities. To be clear, military-civil fusion, I discussed earlier, is at the heart of this innovation process. And many, many uh, laboratory, be it civilian and military, worked actually together towards uh, this end. Within this framework, it's also quite important to say that some non-military companies and some non-private companies, non-state-owned companies, uh, have a key role to play in the innovation process. And I will take just one example and then finish on that. The key example is Deep Blue. So Deep Blue is a company funded in 2013 by the Shenyang Institute of Automation, one key research institute of the Chinese Academy of Science. It's, uh, among others, actually hosts the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Laboratory. Uh, today, Deep Blue is considered as a top unicorn in terms of intelligence underwater equipment. Uh, Deep Blue is able actually to uh, vertically integrate all the UUV related activities, focusing on research, development, production, and the sale, be it of autonomous underwater vehicle, underwater gliders, or cable operated underwater vehicles. In January 2019, Xi Jinping visiting actually a Deep Blue's booth at the Tianjin exhibition on collaborative civil military innovation. And the company Deep Blue was listed among the top 20 Chinese enterprises in the technology uh, sectors. One of the top company is a high underwater glider, literally sea wings, that is developed actually not initially by Deep Blue, but by the Shenyang Institute of Automation. But Deep Blue got actually the exclusive exploitation rights to commercialize it in 2016. This uh, glider got a lot of uh, national records uh, from mineral exploration in the Southern Indian Ocean four years ago to going as deep as 6,500 meters in the Mariana Trench uh, and also by staying more than 100 days underwater. This improvement of UUV technology in China under the cover of civilian research program could however uh, considerably uh, increase the capabilities of the Chinese Navy and the control of the other seas. And to conclude, it's very, very important for these companies uh, to acquire actually through civilian uh, procurement, uh, technology and talents from abroad with the support of Chinese central authorities, which is not actually without security risk for uh, Western and European companies. The Shanghai, the Shenyang, sorry, in the uh, Institutes of Automation can actually circumvent sectorial embargoes by using civilian companies such as uh, Deep Blue to obtain uh, dual-use technologies. It requires, of course, an increased monitoring of Chinese investment abroad, but also of international cooperation, regardless today of the official status, civilian or military, of the Chinese markets. And I will conclude to um, let actually more of a view, I guess, on the US. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, for this very detailed, very technical, but extremely um, uh, accurate uh, briefing, a testimony to uh, effort the uh, one of the strengths of the foundation, which is to blend uh, technical, military, and political expertise. Now, I will give the floor to Philippe, Philippe Hall, for the US perspective. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, you heard me? Is it okay? Yes. Do you hear me? Okay, I go. Um, can I remind, uh, can, I remind uh, can I remind presenters to switch off their microphones when they don't speak? So, Philippe, now the the only mic which should be open at this point should now be Philippe's. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, as a just to follow uh, Antoine's presentation of the of the the, the, Ch of the Chinese uh, various capabilities, I follow on the U.S. perception 
Alors, the agenda. Hop, uh, hop. Yes, with the uh, follow the agenda, uh, just as uh, uh, Bruno uh, told in the introduction, uh, the perceived erosion of the US superiority. Perceived erosion, which is different than uh, objective erosion, potentially. Uh, a range of new concepts, force design and capabilities development initiatives to regain the advantage. I took the term from the uh, Admiral Davidson in the PACOM Commander uh, Capabilities Estimate, recently published. Uh, the alleged emerging warfighting concept, which seems to uh, one, one can draw up from uh, the, um, uh, all these uh, initiatives and strategies, and some questions of deb uh, and debates on that. So, um, as a start, a reminder all US military continue to implement the 2018 National Defense Strategy, which put the great competition with China and Russia at the top of defense priorities, followed by Iran, North Korea, and violent extremist organization. But one could say that currently, uh, the US focus is China, 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 as said the, the Secretary of Defense Mark Esper last year. So one of the primary aims of the uh, National Defense Strategy is to direct the buildup of a US joint force able to blunt as early as possible, any rapid aggression aiming the fait accompli, uh, not particularly on, on, on Taiwan uh, by China, also also by uh, by, by, by Russia in, uh, in Europe, instead of responding it lately with an overwhelming but cumbersome deployment. There is a quasi consensus within US military, as well as think tanks, about the erosion of US superiority. Its modernization did slow down during a decade of counterinsurgency, urgency, followed by an half decade of budget constraints in the aftermath of the subprime crisis. During that time, Russia and China accelerated, accelerated the development of the capabilities of counterintervention, the so-called A2AD capabilities in Western terminology. I took here a couple of slides from uh, uh, the RAND Corporation uh, scorecard studies comparing the balance of potential of US and China, and also a very illustrative slide, one of the numerous very illustrative slides of, of the CSBA studies, which, which is CSBA, you know, which is at the forefront of the, the debate on uh, US capabilities evolution and the A280 A issue. When you, um, to, to, to illustrate my words, that is that, um, uh, trying to 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 go into uh, into to be more a little bit more specific about uh, such threat. Uh, I start with the most emblematic threat: the, the famous DF twenty one D anti ship ballistic missile. It may no longer it is no longer uh, potentially the primary issue, given the doubt are regarding its real capability and the possible courses of action to disrupt the kill chain of the missile. Uh, the main concern seems rather rely on the ability of Chinese naval and air power to overwhelm naval forces with precision munition salvos, while strategic support forces would disrupt their vital C4 ISR systems. Such, capability, such capabilities include HC long range bombers equipped with cruise missiles, uh, as well as hundreds of fourth generation fighters such as the J-10 and new fifth generation fighters, the J-20. The rapid expansion, as outlined by Antoine uh, uh, earlier, of the fleet capacity, the, the, the number of uh, the number of, vessels, of Chinese vessels, as well as the development of their capabilities. For example, the, the new uh, Type 055 destroyer, which is equipped with long-range anti-ship missile, the, the, the range of the uh, YG-100 missile exceeds, for example, or is credited at least uh, with uh, eight or 900 kilometers, uh, which, which is um, better that uh, the range, the radius of action, let's say, of carrier-based fighter with most of their anti-surface weapons, of course, without air refueling. The vessel are also equipped with uh, the nav uh, navalized version of the famous F-300 systems, the HQ-9 long-range air defense systems. Conversely, 
US Navy disinvested after the Cold War and until recently in anti-surface warfare capabilities. Therefore, US military consider that its carrier strike group and large surface combatants trying to operate in or close to China Sea would be currently outgunned and outranged. Even in the undersea domain, PLA Navy intend to offset the enduring superiority of US attack submarines, not only by the number of the submarines, but also by a new concept relying heavily of networks of undersea sensors and probably suppression cost of action. Finally, anti-satellite kinetic and not kinetic means, as well as other cyber and electronic warfare capabilities, are going to disrupt the vital C4 ISR apparatus for the US air and naval power, stemming uh, its effectiveness from this networking. So to put it briefly, the primary issue of the Navy and, uh, and in the PACOM is no longer the power projection, but the sea control. To reverse, to reverse this course in the PACOM, the Joint Staff and the services launched several key initiatives this last year. On the Navy and Maricon side, the development of new concept, distributed maritime operations, electromagnetic maneuver warfare. I should have started with this one, which I display earlier. Littoral operations in a contested environment and expeditionary advanced base operation. The, the later has been initiated by the, uh, by the US Marine Corps. A new naval force structure, uh, updating the, the 2016 force structure assessment to better implement the national defense strategy and this new concept. It seems that to have been a very painful process, as a matter of fact. I, the, the, the work have, seems to have been taken over by the Office of the Secretary of Defense from the Navy. An output should be released within a couple of weeks, uh, with almost one year delay. The announcement of a radical change in the force design of the Marine Corps by its new commander, General Berger. From the Army side, this is, of course, the multi-domain operations. The primary focus of the Army remains the deterrence of Russia. Things could evolve, and the, some elements of the many elements of the modernization strategy are suited and well conceived for Western Pacific area. It includes, for example, the multi-domain task force, the MTDF, with a pilot program has been hosted by Army Pacific. The long-range precision fire is a top priority of the Army capabilities development, which encompass anti-ship anti variants, for its new missiles, I always, I, of course, hypersonic missiles. The Air Force long-term strategy uh, is also uh, a key element as it aims to develop an air power which will be far more agile and resistant, executing also multi-domain operations through uh, more distributed command and control and combining exquisite platforms like B1, B B21 bomber, F-22, F-35 fighters, and the massification with low-cost systems. There is also uh, a new attempt to, to develop uh, an integrated joint C2 architecture, the joint all domain command and control, which would allow to multiple kill chains between ISR C2 and effector nodes, more precisely making interoperable various services architecture. The USD gave the responsibility of the endeavor to the Air Force recently, last year, for example. Regain the advantage, as I said earlier, by Admiral Davidson in the PACOM commander, express the command, the, its uh, combatant command capability needs and related estimated cost as requested by the Congress in 2018. As a matter of fact, it's, a, it's a dedicated to that, it's a, uh, an aggregation of the implication of, of, the, of this various concept. Um, this new concept and force structure initiative made, of course, renewed technological investment throughout the Pentagon, particularly in such areas as high velocity weapons, not only personics, uh, autonomous systems, directed energy weapons, and emerging combat clouds, uh, which are happening in the era of a new network centric warfare, a new era. How this technology will progressively transform US forces over the next decade. All this development allowed to outline a new warfighting concept or a set of warfighting concept regarding potential operations in the area. Such concepts seem rather consistent. It's not unsurprising as several of them are based on a lot of common experiments, such as the 
uh, global integrated war game which took place at the fall of 2019. Moreover, it should be noted that the Joint Staff is currently rebuilding its, fa its family of concepts around the thread-based logic. I won't elaborate on that. I think we, we come back to the question on that. So the main issue, this is my slide. I, I don't have the skills. Uh, I don't have the skills of a CSBA or Hudson Institute expert, but I try to, 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 to make a sketch of my understanding of my understanding of the emerging concept uh, or US emerging concept. So the main issue is for the US to be able to shape the enduring competition with contact forces, which being able to early dis delay, disrupt, and to deny adversary offensive with such blunt forces either forward deployed and expedition at once. Contact force in the competition on the day-to-day -day basis and blunt force in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, war. This requires maintaining a strong deployment within range of adversary weapons and enhancing significantly not only the, the, the lethality, but also the resilience of all these forces. This means not only the reduction of their vulnerability, but also the need for mass for capacity to absorb casualties. Such demands result in two kinds of layout. Uh, the Altogether supported by C4ISR capabilities, of course, the, the, the JET-C2 I uh, earlier mentioned. Marines distinguish standing and standoff forces. CSBA experts talk, uh, talk about inside and outside forces. Strictly speaking, standing and standoff forces are relatively dependent on the range of the adversary effect. Besides, at long run, Chinese weapons can potentially strike beyond the second chain of island, all U.S. forces in the Seattle could be considered as standing. So for this reason, I will rather use MDO, uh, the Army MDO concept terms of close area, presumably the China Sea, the tactical support area, presumably the Philippine Sea between the two chains of island, and the operational support area, presumably east of the second chain of island. Force forward deployed near to cl close area would provide most of the contact layer and part of the blunt layer. One reason for the Navy since several years to revoke A2 AD terms, which Army continue to use, as a, uh, but the Navy don't want, is that the notion would imply a no-go zone in early phase of the conflict. US forces is preparing exactly for the contrary. They intend to exploit the main geographic advantage provided by the first chain of islands linking Okinawa to Taiwan to Philippines, which provide many bottlenecks for any Chinese naval development. The force design 2030 is aimed to redesign the US Marine Corps precisely for this task. It reverses the classical relationship between the USMC and the Navy. Until now, and since decades, Lasernex were employed either as a second army in land campaigns or as uh, an amphibious assault force, a primary route supported by Navy ships. General Berger wants a core today, a core far more integrated with the Navy as its fleet marine force. Under the EABO concept, the, uh, the Expeditionary Advanced Based Operations concept, the Marine Corps would maneuver and fire from island to island, what I tried to capture in the, in the, in the, orange, uh, um, in the orange bubble. From most air locations, the Expeditionary Advanced Base, small platoon of Marines would operate long anti-ship missile and counter-land missile and or ISR means and other capabilities that would redeploy to another island, swatting Chinese targeting efforts while maintaining offensive courses of action. Another element of this land-based seaward-centric approach would be the Army units. As summarized by the Admiral Harris, former PACOM commander, I'd like to see the Army's land forces sink a ship, shoot down a missile, shoot down the aircraft that fires at missile near, simulta near simultaneously. Multi-domain task force is the first American tactical unit designed to perform multi-domain operations, encompassing potentially not only the wrong wrong fires, but also air and missile defense, cyber, and electronic warfare while being directly supported by space forces. Air Force would also contribute to this near to close area forces, primary tactical combat force deployed at Cadena. Uh, US Air Force dedicated a great deal of efforts to enhance the, the resilience of these theater bases. Regarding naval forces, 
DMO, the Distributed Maritime Operation, is the extension of the distributed lethality concept envisioned by surface warfare community in, 90, um, in 1995. Distributed lethality is intended to give a more offensive role to surface combatants by taking benefits from new anti-ship weapons. Anti -ship weapons sorry. The, wave, the force would be distributed among several surface action groups, uh, making it difficult for the Chinese to target them. GMO just expands this logic to the entire fleet at the Seattle level. In this construct, the real pest of the Chaos Tri Group remains unclear. The relevancy and the comparative vulnerability of the aircraft carrier have been widely debated several years ago. Most experts consider now that the aircraft carrier continues to be a critical asset, but they point out, just as the Navy itself, that its air group is lacking range and penetration capabilities. In the midterm, more, um, most F-30C as well as the new MQ-25 Stingray tanker UAV are intended to mitigate these shortfalls, albeit very limitedly. One could postulate that the CSG would be engaged within tactical support area, but rather at long distance of the, of the close area. Force operating at the longer distance would be primarily provided not only by the bulk of this Navy CSG, but also by the Air Force bomber fleet operating from the other hand of the tactical support area. The reinforcement of the later, which will be centered on the early anticipated B-21 Raider new bomber, seems to be the last survivor of the plan Air Force we need, intended to augment the structure of the Air Force, a plan the Air Force are obviously given up to a lack of resources. Despite the famous tyranny of distance, fighters would play also a potentially a role. U.S. military in, 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 indeed intend to distribute facilities first along the second chain of island in green at the right end of the, of the, of the diagram, supplementing Guam with other airfields in the Mariana Islands to, uh, to again foil ch uh, Chinese targeting by DF-26 and bombers and other missiles. But also in the depth of the operational support area eastward, from this chain to Hawaii, for example, by creating an air power hub for large platforms at wake. So resilience through distribution and lethality through all domain operations seems to be the key aspect of this construct. Finally, is the last slide. We don't have, we of course, do not have the presentation, the pretension, sorry. Uh, to make any critical assessment of it, because this presumed layout has been the subject of many war games and simulations by many staff of experts. We do not sufficient data to do it anyway, and many uncertainties remain and will remain as most of these developments are classified. We will therefore launch a bunch of questions from a very outside point of, point of view, and, uh, and also uh, will outline various open debates facing the development of required capabilities. The most critical one, and I think it's related not only to, um, to, to what uh, Antoine explained, but also I think it's uh, related to potentially to, uh, to, what, to the Valérie, uh, Valérie presentation. The most critical one seems to be sparsely debated despite the need for alliance and partnership regularly uh, reaffirmed in, uh, in US documents. It is what is, what is the agreement of the Philippines and Japan, which constitutes the base of the viability of this construct? American planners probably place that as a strategic assumption of their work. However, this is not self-evident, especially in the case of Philippines. The, opera the operational standpoint raises up several other questions, particularly regarding the EABO concept. What is the real room for maneuver along the first chain of islands? Most of this island seems to be reefs, with very few places to establish a large number of EAB. General Berger indicated a requirement for a range of at least 315 nautic miles for the core future fire systems. It may imply the intent to be able to sweep the China Sea surrounding Taiwan and to reach the mainland if directed to do so. But uh, most exploitable islands for that seems to be out, out of this range. Well, what would be the kind of the level of effects for a few small long run strike and air defense batteries operating intermittently in such large, large scale confrontation? What is the main posture, offensive or anti-surface defensive warfare? EABO states that the defensive may be you know, the most important force uh, or form of warfare, maybe. If it is the case, applying defensive fires 
to an adversary itself considering the Philippines see as a denier area, uh, rail relevancy questions. If Kairos tribes group, CSG, are engaged at the very limit of its, of its radius of action, and if Air Force bases are under suppression fires by Chinese air power and missiles, what about the required air superiority to prevent Chinese ISR to follow such deployment and to target them? More broadly, so for distributed uh, maritime operation, how to reconciliate the need for emission control, which would guarantee resilience, and the need for coordination, as well as big data exploitation, which imply more and more communications. To, to, to end my work, some debates, open debates and... Uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we, we are, we're going to run out of time, so maybe you could... Um, uh, lay out these questions quickly so that I can give the floor to Valerie. We are really running out of time. Thank you, Philippe. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, go ahead. For, 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 I, I just finished or for Valerie? No, no. Please, uh, please uh, put your questions and debate a bit more quickly so that I can okay. Uh, okay. give the floor to Valerie. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. The, uh, the, um, the first question is related to the force design 2030. Uh, I mean, the, the, the strategic relevancy of General Berger's move in terms of uh, the risk of over specialization of the Marine Corps. The second debate is about the sustainability of the and also the operational suitability for the area of the future integrated naval force structure. Uh, which uh, and the uh, related uh, 30 years naval ship uh, building uh, plan uh, because currently the Navy is too small to implement DMO correctly and at the same time it includes too much exquisite platforms such as DDG-20, uh, uh, the destroyer, Alley Burke, uh, Virginia submarines, whatever and then it would require just as a slide navy uh, navy slide but also it's something which is uh, strongly advocated by uh, some experts uh, such experts as uh, brian clark to include to have uh, less large surface combatants far more uh, small surface combatants and uh, not tens but hundreds of drones but it's very difficult for various reasons we could come back that to the question the sustainability of the Air Force structure uh, and the implementation, the ability to implementation a true, a true joint all domain operation architecture, which continue as always to, to put the challenges of interoperability. Uh, we could come back to that, to the question. Thank you very much, everybody. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. I personally <laughs> thought that your sketches were quite uh, useful. Uh, so thank you for having uh, uh, then put to us. Now I give the floor to Valérie without further ado, and then we'll have a little time for questions and answers. Valérie, for okay, the Japanese so perspective. I'm afraid I will be far less uh, technical than uh, my predecessors, and I will try to just uh, explain the context of uh, Japanese evolution in strategic thinking and foreign policy. Uh, and that uh, the major issue right now for the, the context is, of course, the fact that Prime Minister Abe, who was the uh, longest serving Prime Minister in Japan, has stepped down at the end of August and has been replaced by Prime Minister Suga, with a lot of questions asked about his focus and uh, interest in foreign policy and the continuity of Abe's Prime Minister uh, real interest uh, in foreign strategy and uh, defense issues. So what, uh, first I will make a few points. Uh, what did not change actually? Uh, first, of course, the threat perception. I will uh, come back to China later. This is a major issue, of course. But I would like to stress the fact that one must not forget the threat from North Korea which is very much at the heart of Japan's uh, strategic thinking concerning, for instance, uh, missile defense and discussions actually uh, very important in Japan on these issues. Uh, as uh, Antoine and many people do know, uh, uh, North Korea missile test did not stop. There were, I think, more than 30, 33 uh, missile tests uh, test in, from North Korea since 
May 2019. The nuclear program neither did not abate. And um, there are uncertainties about the role of Kim Jong-un, his sister, on reactions, potential reactions to the elections in the United States. So uh, Japan is very much focused on the quite uh, important risk of potential multiple massive strike capabilities of North Korea missiles increasing. And this is at the, one of the ma major factors taken into account in defense choices and budget. So this is something I wanted to remind because we focus very much on China. This is important, but North Korea is a very pressing threat for Japan. The second thing that did not really change is, of course, the basics of relations with the United States. Uh, Abe was supposed to have had a very good relationship with Trump, Donald Trump, but Suga, the new prime minister, actually he did participate to all but one of the 38 phone calls uh, between uh, Prime Minister Abe and President Trump. So he was very much there in the background. But what did not change with the US is the complexity and uncertainties. Uh, complexity means two things. Uh, the US-Japan relationship uh, dating back uh, more than 60 years remains at the core of Japan and the region security. Uh, whatever the president of the United States might be, uh, but uh, in both cases, uncertainty, uncertainty sorry, do remain. And the major issue for Japan, it's not a new one, is the issue of reassurance, being convinced that, that the US would act whatever the situation, particularly with China. And this question for Japan has been there for years, and actually since the end of the Cold War, uh, on the emergence of China and the predominance increasingly of what is called gray zone risk, with much more difficult to define than the Soviet threat, for instance. And the first major shock for Japan is not recent. It was in 1998 when, for the first, first, first time, sorry, President Clinton did visit China, bypassing Japan. It never happened before. And it signaled to Tokyo that uh, the importance of Japan as a security and strategic partner for the US was there, of course, but maybe was diminishing. And since then, multiple reassurances have been given by the United States, by Obama, by people around Trump, but it never was enough to fully lift the uncertainties, particularly concerning the situation around the Senkaku archipelago. Uh, the latest um, uh, declaration by people around uh, Trump was by Kevin Schneider, who is a commander of U.S. forces in Japan, and he said recently that the U.S. is 100% steadfast in its commitment to help the government of Japan with the situation in the Senkaku. But in spite of this, uh, some people still do question, and not only in Japan, uh, the real, and this is important in terms of uh, perception, uh, uh, to what extent the U.S. might be ready to go if something happened uh, in the vicinity of uh, Japan around these islands. Uh, and with the United States uh, regarding Japan, there are also uncertainties uh, fed, up, fed by the difficulties regarding U.S. bases in Okinawa and the perception in the Japanese public of the role of the United States. Uh, as I, um, I will not deal in that, but uh, as you may know, there are a lot of discussions about relocation of bases in Okinawa, and it has been going on for years, and it's still not solved. Uh, what also did not change is... Uh, uh, the position of China, of course, as a major economic partner for Japan. It's about approximately 20% of Japan trade. Uh, it went from 1 billion at the end of the 1970s to more than 300 billion today per year. Uh, Japanese companies would be affected by any decoupling between the US and China. Some already suffer, uh, like, for instance, a micro processor producers who will struggle to find uh, a replacement for Huawei, uh, a major client for Japan. 
now under embargo from US technology. As a result, uh, for big administrations like the Ministry of Economy, the METI, um, on business interest, on organization, the economic issues, economic interest uh, remains a major factor in the China relationship, and it, it might play in favor of closer relationship with China, which is always a temptation in some circles in Japan. So to sum up, what did not change is actually the increased unpredictability of the strategic landscape around, Jap uh, around Japan, both because of China and for other reasons, of course, the relation with the United States. My second point is, of course, what did change? In Japan, as I mentioned earlier, there, is, there was a change of prime minister. And the first question is for how long? Uh, uh, this is a first question mark. Abe uh, gave us uh, the illusion of a kind of permanency, but it was very new and absolutely the exception for Japanese politics because before Abe, uh, the, there were uh, approximately one prime minister per year in Japan. And this, of course, gave much, this is what was called the revolving door uh, policy in Japan, with prime minister uh, changing every year. Uh, and this, of course, gave much power to bureaucrats and party factions. With prime minister Suga, uh, the question mark uh, related to our subject is his focus on internal politics on far less apparently and what we see now on foreign policy. Plus the fact that uh, people like Toshihiro Nikai, who is the secretary general of the majority party, the LDP, uh, known for his more accommodating approach to China, played a, an important role in giving Prime Minister Suga his new position. His influence uh, might be balanced, however, by Nobue Kishi, who is a new defense minister, is a younger brother of Prime Minister Abe. He is known for being uh, more hawkish, as some Japanese would say, very pro-Taiwan, and it might help balance again this potential evolution of Japanese foreign policy towards a more accommodating relationship with China. Uh, the second point is. Uh, U.S.-Japan relations, as we saw, have always been extremely important at the core of Japan's security policy. And Suga might be tempted to focus even more on this big power relationship, U.S. on one side, of course, China for another region, which might have consequences on Japan's involvement in developing other partnerships in spite of what has been declared recently with other powers, and I am thinking particularly with European powers. Uh, on, almost on the day he became prime minister, uh, Suga uh, asked his 20 ministers to present 40 priority projects, and to Motegi, who is a foreign minister, he was one for the previous government, he remained a foreign minister. He gave him two missions. One is strengthen US-Japan relationship and to implement, in a way, the Indo-Pacific concept. This is good, but as I said, it raises questions on how close will Suga cabinet be uh, to the US administration, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of issues not solved before the election in the United States. Some say that Joe Biden might be easier to deal, to deal with uh, from a Japanese point of view, but less engaged in, in spite of the consensus between Republicans and Democrats these days regarding China, for instance. On the other side, Trump is difficult, and if there are new uh, questions might be uncertainties might increase after his re-election. Uh, the fact that uh, people still believe that he could make a deal with China, who knows? Uh, and what about also the big question for Japan, uh, Japanese financial contribution to the US basis in, uh, in Japan, which is a very big issue for Japan these days. Um, 
So Suga said that U.S.-Japan relationship were the linchpin of Japan foreign policy. But again, what about other relationships that Abe invested very much into? India, Australia, of course, are very much closer. But for the EU, uh, as you may remember, uh, China, uh, Japan, sorry, signed a strategic uh, a free trade agreement with Europe in 2018, but also a strategic partnership, extremely important. But you have to, to put some flesh on this partnership, and we, it remains to see how it will be done with uh, that new government in Japan. And again, the question is, will Japan refocus, as it used to do before, exclusively or more exclusively on US and China, and much less on other partners? And all this, of course, is in the context of the big uh, game changer, which is uh, China new policy, as Antoine presented in his uh, at the beginning, China plus the conjunction of China plus the COVID-19 situation. The two being, of course, related. Uh, COVID-19 had dramatic consequences for Japan, as for all the countries. Economically, uh, maybe less, but still it's important. Uh, there is a 28% drop in uh, Japanese uh, economic growth uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, the latest figures are a little bit better, but still the economic consequences are tremendous for Japan, including in terms of tourism and opening up to, to the Chinese uh, tourists in, in Japan. Uh, more importantly, Japanese exports dropped more than 20% because after COVID-19, and the figures are very interesting because the drop was 21% with the US, but it increased recently. Exports increased to China by 5% in the latest months. So why I mention these uh, non-strategic things is that because, of course, it will increase the weight of those who are in favor of more accommodating relationship with China. And it will be very tempting for Japan to focus much more on the economy, meaning better relation with China than on strategic issues, like it was the case under Prime Minister uh, Abe. So this is an extremely important point to take into account. The COVID-19 uh, consequences for Japan company, Japanese companies and uh, the emergence of China. China, uh, China assertive, assertiveness, sorry, or, uh, char aggressive character, I might say, is not new. This is not something that we discovered in the last months. Uh, China military capability development is not new neither. Uh, what is new, though, is a kind of no limit feeling uh, on rising tensions in spite of the COVID-19 crisis. For uh, China President Xi Jinping, ideology, meaning party survival strategy, apparently tend to go over pragmatism. And this is true with Europe, but this is also true on other regions in the world, of course, but this is also true with Japan. Uh, for instance, in Japan, in spite of COVID-19, uh, it did not stop China to increase uh, considerably uh, its uh, encroachments and activities around the Japanese archipelago, the Senkaku Islands. Uh, the Defense White Paper of Japan, published in July 2020, mentioned that, uh, uh, criticized or mentioned, the, I quote, the relentless attempt uh, to by China to unilaterally try to change the statu quo around the Senkaku by using coercion and pressure. So it was pretty clear, loud and clear language regarding the action of China, but also in the South China Sea. And uh, Japan is participating, participating increasingly to maneuvers uh, with the US and others uh, around near the South China Sea. Uh, from April 2019 to August 2020, in the middle of uh, that COVID crisis, out of 519 days, uh, more than 400, 456 days 
uh, Chinese forces were in the vicinity, contiguous waters, not territorial, but contiguous waters around the Senkaku. So this is permanent now. Um, and it was a double the previous period in 2019. Uh, in uh, incursion in territorial waters around the Senkaku, there were four in 2019, five in 2020, one, the latest one in July, which it was the longest one where uh, Japanese ships uh, remained in the vicinity uh, for more than uh, 39 hours. And this, of course, puts a tremendous pressure on Japanese self-defense forces and Japanese coast guards. So what is done and what uh, signs can, do we have already about what will be done in Japan regarding these issues? Uh, with China, uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga had his first uh, bilateral talk on the phone with Xi Jinping it was the first since, uh, since 2018, on Friday, last Friday, and uh, she had previously said that he hoped that Suga and Japan would make the right choice, so there, there was a warning by China. But uh, in spite of this, uh, Suga also mentioned during that phone call that he wanted to improve, uh, to, to go on with high-level meetings with China, including a possible visit by Wang Yi, the uh, foreign ministers, uh, as soon as the beginning of next month. Uh, but still, um, the pressure to cancel and not postpone anymore the Xi Jinping visit that should have taken place at the beginning of this year is also uh, very high. Uh, according to a poll, uh, opinion, public opinion poll published by Nikkei in July, 62% uh, of the J Japanese people are in favor of cancelling a uh, state visit by President Xi Jinping. Uh, the perception of China in Japan is very low. More than 90% of the population has a negative perception of China. But at the same time, when you look at the main issue that people are focusing on, uh, the economy is much higher, or COVID-19 is much higher than uh, uh, China. As a, as Valérie, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to also to ask you to conclude pretty quickly because it's already it's near. We are already past the yeah, point of our schedule time. Yeah, I'm sorry to late. As the last one, uh, it's very very difficult to stick to the less than 15 minutes. So what I wanted for the US, there will be of course uh, further discussions and uh, with uh, Prime Minister, with uh, sorry, Vice President Pence, Pence should visit Japan soon. So, but the last point I wanted to make, and uh, uh, but as the consequence of all this uh, is on defense. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a new uh, prime minister, uh, defense minister, as I mentioned, uh, supposed to be rather hawkish in China. Um, the defense budget is still increasing on a moderate uh, one uh, basis, but still 13% since uh, 2012. And, um, uh, but it is far less uh, than the uh, Japanese, uh, the Chinese, sorry, defense budget at uh, 48.6 uh, so, sorry billion US uh, dollars. In terms of capabilities, the stress is on building a multi-domain defense force able to defend the territory, including, and this is a very important point, remote islands, but also to give the Japanese self-defense forces the capacity to implement its new, more proactive strategy for peace, as well as collective self-defense, following adoption of new defense laws by Prime Minister Abe in 2015. Uh, this It means that money will go to the improvement of traditional domain, maritime, maritime aerospace, including the transformations of the Izumo helicopter carrier into multi-purpose carrier, uh, air and missile defense, uh, logistics, and interestingly, on standoff, what the Japanese call standoff defense, and the words is used to call preemptive, potential preemptive strike capabilities. And this is an important, if controversial, issue in Japan, and it will be discussed uh, at the PLD level uh, very soon. Um, just yes, to conclude, we, we really just have to conclude, conclude 
yeah. there is there was a big issue of the cancellation of the two ages ashore project uh, decided by Kono. Uh, and the stress is also in increasing cooperation with the United States, but also to develop capabilities in new domain like space, cyber, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So uh, we will see. Uh, how the Suga administration will evolve uh, on all these issues, and uh, particularly, I think the main issue to follow will be relationship with China as a factor for developing Japanese capabilities. Sorry to have stuck to all Thank you. Thank you very much, Frédéric. It's, it's five past 12, so we already passed the scheduled time of our seminar. What I suggest is the following. There have been already many questions related to the uh, US-China uh, military balance in the chat, but uh, I have the authorization of the organizers to go up until 12, somewhere like 12.15 or 12.20. And I'd like to ask a first question to all presenters uh, who are also free to answer directly the questions on the chat is about French interest and capabilities in the region. Uh, my overall question is what should France, what can and what should, two different questions, France do from a strategic and military standpoint in the region that it is not doing right now or that it is not doing well? It's a very broad question. But I hope that each of you can have some, uh, can shed some light on this problem. It can be a very short answer or a longer answer. Uh, say you have uh, approximately uh, three minutes each, if that's okay with you. Let me start with uh, Antoine, if you have anything to say on this particular topic. Well, I suspect you will. Sure, I, I will try to be very brief. Uh, as you all know, the new French Indo-Pacific security strategy was presented a few years ago. France uh, has been the first European countries to do so. The UK and Germany did it uh, quite recently. But the French one really has a big security dimension. Uh, even though the Indo-Pacific strategy might at the end of the day be much wider, including, of course, diplomatic, economic, uh, uh, environmental, etc. dimension. Uh, it's quite difficult, of course, in terms of capacities to deploy much more uh, to, uh, to the South Pacific or to the Indo-Pacific uh, without, of course, weakening some other deployments closer to, to, to France and to the, to the metropole. Uh, but one key question in, in the meantime, I would say, what you can do in several, uh, in few weeks or few months is, of course, not only declaratory diplomacy, to uh, talk about Indo-Pacific and our interest in the region uh, more often, including actually to the French public, because many people in France are not aware that there is an Indo-Pacific strategy, even less an Indo-Pacific security strategy. So to bring the Indo-Pacific concept, I would say, to a broader audience and to the political debate. Second, to do maybe more with our allies and partners uh, in the region, uh, the president listed, of course, uh, Australia, India and Japan, uh, but also uh, Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, and what can be done is basically more uh, contacts, more interactions, uh, more uh, military training, more military uh, education training uh, of uh, young officers from the region, etc. So I would say behind all the military capacities in itself, and you cannot solve that in a few weeks or a few months, of course, there is still a lot that can be done, both toward the French public to get a social and political acceptance of the concept, to remind also, of course, the French uh, public that we are de facto an Indo-Pacific power with more than one million uh, French people living in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So to get this public and, and social acceptance, I would say, and then to do even more on the diplomatic uh, level and military diplomatic uh, level with our uh, allies and partners over there. Thank you very much, Antoine. Philippe? Oh. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, I complimentary to what uh, Antoine said, I will uh, 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 long to, to mid to long term perspective on that. I, I, I think we cannot afford to ignore the absolute need to reinforce uh, our um, uh, uh, capabilities in such areas because among the key potential crises over the long term, you have clearly at a good place potential action, what you say, gray zone, whatever. 
uh, Blue Horizon strategies, not only in the Pacific, but also in Indian Ocean, uh, which put under pressure our ability to, on the day-to-day -day basis, to uh, uh, execute a control of our sovereign, uh, to, to exercise our sovereignty on our uh, ZEE. Uh, and uh, I think at least we should, uh, or of course, it's, it's always, you know, the list au Père Noël, as we say in French, uh, for capabilities, always an enduring list. But at least if we could modernize, change the uh, um, very edging ships, uh, aircraft on these areas, we absolutely need to do that. Absolutely, because uh, we will have, uh, I, I, I don't think it, it's it's not a question. We will have, in mid to long terms, issues of sovereignty, or uh, pressure against the sovereignty in those various areas from neighboring countries, neighboring power, whatever they could be. Uh, in ten or twenty years from now, we we don't know exactly. Potentially China, other ones. Uh, and in in the PECOM area, we should be reminded, in complementary to what, to what Antoine said, that is that we have clearly, contrary to the US, we have clearly an Indo PECOM perspective. US uh, include, say, okay, US Indo PECOM, but as a matter of fact, they don't have the interest we have in the in, uh, in, uh, Indian Ocean, and they remain clearly a PECOM focus. Our area of interest and our area of concern is broader than that. Thank you very much, Philippe. Valérie? Uh, yes, just uh, two words. Uh, one, what is, uh, I mean, the role uh, France could play at the European level is quite important. Uh, especially after, uh, after Brexit, but uh, as you, you may know, recently uh, the German um, adopted also an Indo-Pacific strategy, so there are some complementarities and definitely I think we absolutely must uh, take a lead in increasing the, uh, the awareness at the European level of uh, the strategic but also uh, diplomatic and political significance of the, the, that region as a whole, not only the Indian Ocean, even though it's much closer. The other point is uh, in the Pacific, uh, all capabilities are extremely limited. And there are a lot of expectations from countries in the region, and especially Japan, who always want to remind us how we are a Pacific country. But in terms of what needs to be done, particularly surve surveillance of huge EEZ, uh, this is a, a challenge that could not be met uh, only by France first, uh, but also it needs uh, a, an extremely important investment in terms of maritime capacity, and it remains to be seen what can be done in that field, and uh, nothing is solved yet. Thank you very much, Valérie. Um, and unless I have some specific instructions from the organizers, I think I will end it there because of uh, uh, the uh, time constraints that some of us have. So I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you, Valérie, uh, Antoine, and Philippe. Uh, I think we have uh, given to you uh, through this uh, first uh, a web conference organized by uh, co-organized by FRS, a uh, wide sample of um, our expertise regarding strategic military and political issues. We apologize for a few technical uh, um, problems that we've had since the beginning. Uh, this was the first time we we're using this platform, and I'm sure that uh, things will be uh, even better, uh, both on the uh, uh, both on the technical uh, question and that. Um, and uh, then, then this time. So thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, many questions have been addressed in the chat that, uh, and I encourage the presenters to discuss them directly if they can with, uh, with to, uh, I encourage participants to address directly the presenters. You have our email addresses. You can ask us questions. And uh, I, I think uh, the next conference will take place sometimes in the coming two weeks. You will uh, receive an invitation. Goodbye from me, and thank you to everyone. A good day and a good evening if you are far away. Thank you.